Hello, I'm Rebecca the Maths Lady, here to help you become an expert primary maths teacher so that all your children become fluent, creative and confident with their maths. This is the third video in the series on teaching maths to children aged six or six to seven years old, which in England is year two. And this video is all about how we teach children to be fluent at using the bead string and the maths that we do with the bead string. Lots of teachers already know that this is an incredibly important bit of apparatus at this stage and they're used to seeing children learn really quickly with it. But not many teachers do everything that's possible with it, so I suspect there'll be something in this video that you'll find useful even if you already love this bit of apparatus. In this video I'm going to explore this mathematical structure and explain why it's so important and what it can and can't do. We'll look at how we teach children to name numbers up to 100 with it, and I'll introduce arrow cards. We'll talk about simple calculations and comparing numbers. We'll look at the two, five and 10 times tables. And we'll also introduce the idea of the commutativity of multiplication as being a surprise, which it is to children at this age. And you need to lean into that and understand what a surprise is, but I'll explain all that shortly. And then I'll talk about how we teach children to subordinate the partitioning of one digit numbers when they add and subtract within 100. What I'm talking about there is if we've got a calculation like 68 add 5, instead of counting on one at a time, we start to add 2 to get to 60 and then see that there's 3 left, so the answer is going to be 63. And finally, I'll talk about how we encourage children to think creatively with this bit of apparatus so that they can access maths that's way beyond what we expect from them at this level. Right, let's get started by exploring what this structure is and what it isn't. So it's 100 beads on a string organised into groups of 10. Now to put it into context, I'm going to use this bit of apparatus here. This is penguins on ice and there are lots of gorgeous penguins that you count up by organising them onto icebergs and each iceberg is a line which holds 10 penguins. And you pop your penguins on the iceberg and then you're going to be able to count them quickly because you can see the tens and the ones and so on. Now these icebergs are great because they clip together beautifully to form a line. So if you've got plenty of space, you can organise all 10 of these icebergs to show the same structure because there are 100 penguins and there are 10 of each colour. So you get the same structure. But these icebergs also clip together side by side like that. And when you do that, they're being organised so that you can see a number square. And that's not what this structure is. I'm going to cover the number square in the next video in this series. You can also keep your tens free. And so they become like base 10 apparatus or Dean's blocks. And again, that's not what I'm looking at today. I will look at that in video six in this series. So this structure is all about organizing objects in groups of 10 in a line. It's also not the number line. The number line is different because in the number line, the obvious marks are for where you end a group of, could be 10, could be another size. The number line shows continuous number and is great for measure or things that show fractions. This structure shows individual objects and it's not great for fractions or decimals. You can imagine half a bead, but beyond that it gets a bit difficult. And this is the world that most six-year-olds are still living in. We call it the world of discrete number, but it's where each object is one thing. And when we transfer to the number line, which we'll do next year, there's a significant mental shift to make. And we need to do that very slowly and carefully. It's really important to work on this structure before you introduce the counting stick. And I generally don't introduce the counting stick or the number line until the next year of maths teaching. When children are more developed, they have better working memory by the time they're seven, nearly eight, than they have when they're six going on seven. So when they're six going on seven, a lot of children still don't have well-developed abstract working memory and they learn much better 
with a multi-sensorial experience which this apparatus gives. If you can't get hold of this apparatus, I have created a worksheet which gives pictures of it that you can doodle on, but it really is better to have the beads if you can get them or to make a set with just some thread and two colours of beads. This can be downloaded from all the usual places for free and you can find it if you go through www.authenticmaths.co.uk forward slash worksheets. So the most important thing we need to do with this apparatus at this stage is to make sure that all children can name their numbers up to 100. They need to know that for a number like this, they're counting three tens and two ones, therefore the number is 32. And they're going to need lots of practice with their tens numbers, counting 10, 20, 30, and so on. So they get to know their names of numbers and you can count those up and down really frequently until they know them. So they should have already had some exposure to this structure and have learned to go past 20 carefully and have developed some understanding of how these numbers are named. If your children have not done that yet, you need to go back to the video in the previous series on this and here's a link to it now. In that video, we worked a lot with the big bead frame and you may still want to have a big bead frame for your demonstration at the front of the classroom while children work with their bead strings. So now you need to build tremendous fluency with children naming numbers. So they should be able to show you the correct number of beads if you say a number, if you show them the digits for a number, and if you show them a written number. And if you take this carefully, you may begin to find your dyslexic children who are confusing the orders of digits and you'll be able to diagnose problems with reading very early. Now, if children are confusing the orders of digits, then it's a great idea to introduce arrow cards. And personally, I would introduce them with all children anyway, because they're a really good resource to work with. And these simply show that this first digit is a number of tens. So the six represents 60 in this number and the second digit represent the ones. And if the child gets confused, they can check and see. So they can really see that that must be 62 because it's 60 and two. You can specifically test children's understanding of their reading of two digit numbers by trying to confuse them with numbers like 28 and 82. Are they correctly decoding them? And you also want to check their hearing, that they're correctly understanding the difference between 14 and 40. If you say them clearly, is every child getting it right? Or are they confusing their understanding of similar number names, which can easily happen. And if it's happening, it's really important to work on it. So next, if you demonstrate a number and you might do it with your big bead frame, can children name that number? Can they name it orally? Can they write the digits? And can they start to write the words for those numbers? And if they can't write them, perhaps you could have some number words, all the tens and the words for the numbers up to nine, and they can combine them to show you that they can at least read those number names. So once children are fluently and correctly naming and understanding the names of numbers up to 100, next you want to work with questions where you're asking them to find four more than a number and they can move the apparatus to see the answer or so many less than a number. And you can ask them to compare numbers, which is bigger, which is smaller, and how big is the difference between them or how much larger is one than the other or how much smaller. And then of course, you can start to translate those questions into number sentences. So rather than saying four more than 63, you might say 63 add four equals. And of course, whenever we're comparing numbers, it's really useful to practice the use of these signs. Right, the next role these beads can play is to help children to learn their two, five and ten times tables. So as we're setting them up, say to count in fives, we can clearly show those fives within the total structure. So as children start to count five, ten, fifteen, twenty, we're offering them a really powerful structure which will help them to visualise their counting in fives. And the reason we introduce twos, fives and tens first is because they fit within this structure so beautifully. So we need to count in twos, fives and tens. 
and you may want to get the children to set up counting beads or you may set this up on your big bead frame so that everyone can see it and you can touch and you can move the beads and then we can start counting tables so instead of just counting 5, 10, 15, we'd start to say 1, 5 is 5, 2, 5 is 10, 3, 5 is 15. And we're teaching children to keep track on how many of the groups they've counted with their fingers as they go. Because these children cannot yet retain a great deal of information in their memories. But if we do this, they can look and go, oh, I've done four fives so far and it was 20. And it's so helpful if they've got that in front of them. Now, the next thing about multiplication tables at this stage is that most adults take it for granted that if two tens are 20, then 10 twos are 20. And it comes so naturally and so quickly to them, they don't realize what a huge, huge issue that is for young children. What have you just done? You can tell them as often as you like that you can do multiplication the other way around. But if they don't deeply understand it and they haven't really wrestled with how difficult that idea is, they will forget. And time and time again, you'll reverse multiplication seamlessly and the children will be lost and they'll be learning not to understand their maths, but just to accept rules. So you want to set them some pairs of multiplications like three times five and five times three, or two times seven and seven times two. And they can work in pairs with one child doing one multiplication on their bead string and finding the answer and the other doing the other or you can give one child two bead strings and you want them to really wrestle with these until they absolutely start to see that you get the same answer no matter which way around you do the multiplication always and they convince themselves they don't understand why yet but they deeply know that it's true and whenever you do something like saying, well, I know 10 twos are 20 because two tens are 20, at least now they've got something that you can hook that back into. You can remind them of when they did this activity and they will at least believe you and believe there's some sense in it. We're going to come back to explain why multiplication is commutative in the video on array. But it's so helpful to have a gap between children really deeply discovering that multiplication is commutative and them then coming to understand it and to stretch that out as being one of the amazing journeys of this year of learning. And then hopefully every child will take that journey with you instead of just some of them. Okay, the next task with the counting beads is probably the most important task in the primary curriculum and it is so neglected. In the English curriculum, it's there in year two, adding and subtracting one digit numbers to or from two digit numbers. And when I talk to teachers, lots of teachers do it with the kids who can do it and avoid it with the kids who can't. So let's look deeply at what's going on here. And I've created some worksheets to help you with this. Here's where they're downloaded again. So when we look at a calculation like 68 out of five, some children are gonna put up five fingers and go 69, 70, 71, 72, 73. So there's your 68 and those children uh, counting on one, two, three, four, five, and they can see that the answer is 73. But the children who are going to fly with this are the children who see two of the five going on to make 70 and know that there are therefore three of the five left. So the answer is going to be 73. And those children are doing what we call subordinating partitioning. So they're partitioning the five into a two and a three and they're doing that as a subordinate task to a bigger task. And when children can start to do that, they're gonna fly with their harder maths that they're gonna move on to very soon. And if they are still counting up one at a time or down one at a time for subtraction, they are not. So we need to work on this with every single child. If we look at this 68 out of five, set up this worksheet, so you can say, well, which group of 10 are we aiming for? What's our first step? And they can say, well, we're aiming for 70. So we've added two. And we're trying to add five. So we can use our fingers to see the five. Two have gone on, so we've got three left. So we've still got three to add. Therefore, the answer is 73. And as always, if you want loads of these worksheets, there's a link to click to Jeff Kutcher's site. And if you've got the free download of Adobe Acrobat, you can generate as many of these as you like. 
And if you want answers, you can get answers. And of course, all children should be checking these with their counting beads. And if they make a mistake, don't explain it to them. Just get them to work with their hands and their counting beads to puzzle it out for themselves with however much guidance they need from you. Now, the real biggie in this is the subtraction. Let's look at how tricky this is. 34 subtract 8. Well, the first stage is actually quite easy. We're subtracting, so we're looking for a smaller answer. So we're going to go back to 30 here. And so we've subtracted 4. And the 8, use your fingers again, partitions into 4. And we can see the other partition is 4. And then 30 subtract 4 is the really tricky step. As a grown-up, you can quickly see it's 26. Children will make loads of mistakes with this. And if they didn't have the counting beads, they would get demoralised. But because they're doing it with the counting beads, they shouldn't get stressed. Because if they go wrong, they're going to be able to self-correct and deeply understand what's gone wrong and gradually build an understanding of how to do these calculations fluently. If your class struggles with this, then perhaps they've forgotten their partitions of numbers to 10. So what you could do is practice maybe the partitions of eight and do lots of work on additions of eight, which go past to 10. So you're just continuously practicing all your partitions of eight. And then you could move on to subtractions of eight that go past a multiple of 10. And so you're continuously practicing the same partitions and then you could try a different number until all your class are fluent at all of it. And if some have totally got it and are fluent with all their partitions and are subordinating all their partitions, then they can move on to some more challenging activities while you work with the other children who need your help. Not every child will master this at this stage, but it's quite possible that you can give every child quite a deep understanding of what's going on that they're going to be able to build from in the future. And it's absolutely essential that this stage is not missed because you pick up children aged 10, 11, right up into adulthood who have never learnt to subordinate the partitioning of numbers and are still counting on or back one at a time. And it's too slow for them to think about the bigger issues of what they're doing with more complex calculations. The final step of working with the counting beads is to ask children to create their own calculations with them and puzzle out the answers. And here they can go way beyond the curriculum for this stage. They might try something like 3 times 17. Let them try. They may well get it right. They may come up with questions like 10 add 6 times 2. And you could explore what they mean by that. Do they mean 10 add 6 lots of 2? Or do they mean 10 add 2 lots of 6? Or do they mean 10 add 6? all doubled. And if you're exploring that kind of level of complexity, you're talking about the difference between 10 add 6 times 2 or between 10 add 6 times 2. And you can notate that and explain that it gives different answers because it's fundamentally different things and they can really see it. But just let them be creative and develop their own number sentences and try to support them in their thinking by showing them the correct notation for what they're saying. So your takeaways from this video are that it's essential that children do masses of work with the counting beads at about this age because they're laying down crucial steps in their maths learning that they mustn't miss. They need to be able to show you numbers that you either name verbally or show them with digit cards or show with written words and they need to be able to name numbers that you tell them show them in digits or show them with written words. They need to work on more or less calculations and to start to see them written as additions and subtractions. They need to be able to compare numbers and see which is larger and which is smaller. We need to tease out problems where children are reversing the orders of digits. We need to check their hearing. Are they clearly hearing the difference between 13 and 30? Then we need to work on the 2, 5 and 10 multiplication tables and we need to gradually develop an appreciation of the commutativity of multiplication and that you can reverse the order of a multiplication and that the answer will be the same. The understanding will come later in the video on array. And finally, the most important step is that children need to learn to subordinate the partitioning of one digit numbers in their calculations. So they need to be able to add 
or subtract a one digit number to or from a two digit number in no more than two steps. They need to gradually move on from counting up or down one at a time. And it's a great idea to encourage children to work creatively with the counting beads and create their own calculations and to challenge them to see if they can create really complicated calculations. That's it for this video. The next video will be on number squares. If you found this video useful, please make sure you've subscribed to the channel so you can find it again. And if you've colleagues who you think might benefit from seeing it, please do share it with them. If you have any questions or comments, please do add them in the comments to this video. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this and to challenge yourself to be the very best teacher that you can be. But most of all, enjoy your teaching. Hope to see you soon.